Aldous Huxley and the Buddhist Tradition In Buddhism, Aldous Huxley found a complex and intuitively stimulating, appealing spiritual view. He applied this knowledge of Buddhist philosophy and practice in his utopian novel Island, in which he envisioned a society focused on self-actualization and development of the individual through the Buddhist practices of awareness and the Buddha's noble eightfold path. Born in 1894 in England, Huxley used multiple literary modes to examine the major battle between religion and science which permeated his lifetime. A child of a famous English aristocratic family, Huxley enjoyed a rich intellectual heritage. As Dana Sawyer, one of Huxley's biographers, comments, to be a pivotal and influential thinker was quite nearly a birthright for Aldous Huxley. Two towering ancestors of Huxley's altered the progress of philosophy and thinking in the Victorian age. The repercussions of their passionate life's work influenced modern Western thinking in Huxley's time. Thomas Henry Huxley, a prominent scientist and one of the founding figures of the scientific revolution, was Huxley's grandfather, and Matthew Arnold, an eminent poet who decried the retreat of religion, was Huxley's great-uncle. Thomas Huxley championed Darwin's theory of evolution and helped establish it as an article of faith in the modern mind, a theory that made suspect the divine origin of man and the very existence of God. At the time, this radical idea may have been rejected if not for Thomas Huxley's impassioned defense. It morphed the very moral fabric of the Victorian era. While on one side of the family, Thomas Huxley called for technological progress and rigorous scientific theory, on the other, Aldous Huxley's great-uncle, Matthew Arnold, advocated the necessity of a creative life. A poet, critic, and moralist of the Victorian age, concerned with the clout science was gaining in popular culture, Arnold wrote and spoke about the necessity of art and religion in life. Depicting the sea of faith receding from the shore of modern culture in his famous poem, Dover Beach, his most memorable lines warn, And we are here, as on a darkling plain, swept with confused alarms of struggle and flight, where ignorant armies clash by night. Arnold felt the growing prominence of science and rational thought detracted from the passion of the human experience and spiritual depth. What a fascinating conflict of ideals was contained on Aldous Huxley's family crest, as he was born at the emergence of Western science and recession of commonly held Western spiritual values. Faced with these paradoxical world views, Huxley's life quest would become an intellectual and emotional foray into the various facets of human life and societal values. Particularly, he would search for a unifying spirituality, which recogni recognized rational thought and scientific understanding while promoting the enlightenment of the human race. The purely rational and theoretical nature of much of Western philosophy frustrated Huxley. Western philosophers, even the best of them, they're nothing more than good talkers, he said. Eastern philosophers are often rather bad talkers, but that doesn't matter. Talk isn't the point. Their philosophy is pragmatic and operational like the philosophy of modern physics, except that the operations in question are psychological and the results transcendental. Western metaphysicians make statements about the nature of man and the universe, but they don't offer the reader any way of testing the truth of those statements. This frustration was further explored during his friendship with the British novelist D. H. Lawrence, who emphasized experience, physicality, and instinct as important components of any conscious and enlightened life. Trusting his own experience, Lawrence found lucidity and understanding in observing nature and actively loving other people. Huxley appreciated Lawrence's perspective because his philosophy attended to the practice of living beyond the realm of verbal truth. Huxley was concerned with the application of philosophy in daily life. In Buddhism, he found a vision of spirituality which encouraged the practitioner to arrive at a vision of himself and surrounding reality experientially rather than theoretically. Huxley saw enlightenment as requiring one not only to experience the transcendental, the eternal, but also to be fully present in the imminent and the temporal, to connect with others as well as to be. Several elements in Huxley's personal history illuminate his growing interest in Eastern philosophy. Troubled by significant problems with his eyesight from his youth, Huxley was fascinated with the mind-body connection. He practiced yoga and meditation his entire life, and was absorbed in holistic practices. When his first wife died, he read the Tibetan Book of the Dead at her bedside. So the external trappings of Huxley's life suggest an affinity for Buddhism. However, he would not have classified himself as a traditional Buddhist. As quoted in Sawyer's biography, Huxley wrote, I remain an agnostic who aspires to be a Gnostic, but a Gnostic only on the mystical level. 
a Gnostic without symbols, cosmology, or a pantheon. Given the lineage of intellectuality in Huxley's family, one might have expected him to pursue the more obviously intellectual branch of Buddhism, the Theravada tradition. However, he was actually more attracted to the Mahayana tradition, with its greater social orientation. Mahayana Buddhists specifically talk of the highest state of realization as the Bodhisattva, who, unlike the Theravadan Arhat, is not content merely to experience his or her own awakening, but wishes to share their insight with others. It was the Mahayana tradition that shaped the utopian society that Huxley envisioned in his novel Island. Drawing upon his belief that enlightenment, manifested in awareness of one's surroundings and mental states, would improve individuals and society as a whole, Huxley wrote Island in 1962, framing an island community around Buddhist principles. Huxley's life work, an insatiable curiosity combined with a grand expanse of human knowledge, from experimental psychology to biochemistry, physiology, pharmacology, and religion, and an impressive register of literary credits, poems, essays, travel writing, social satire, and novels, led to the conception of such a society in literary form. Founded by a Buddhist, the Raja, and a Scottish doctor, Macphail, the community of Pala is structured on the commingled principles of Mahayana Buddhism and secular humanism. On the island community of Pala, Oriental philosophy and Western science have mingled, enriching and purifying each other, until both are dedicated to the service of man. Through this marriage of radically opposing philosophies, Huxley found some peace in his lifelong search to reconcile science and spirituality. This synthesizing of East and West is exactly what Huxley thought the real world should strive for. Immediately disparaging Huxley's experimental utopia, critics rejected the underdeveloped character's pedagogical tone and weak plot. However, the critic Holmes recognizes the immense philosophical value of Ireland, while recognizing its literary shortcomings. Read as a novel, as a product of the artistic imagination, Ireland is a failure, Holmes stated. Huxley's characters are at times nothing more than fascinating talking heads, espousing philosophic ideals. However, when viewed solely as a didactic statement about cosmic truth and the nature of man, Ireland is a challenging and courageous vision. Buddhist traditions and philosophies pervade almost all sectors of Palinese life. Sexual intimacy, vocabulary, religion, education, physical exercise, and the media. As, East, as the Eastern scholar Chaku elaborates, Island contains Huxley's, Huxley's mature ideas about religion, sex, and education. Almost all these ideas are based on the theories of Mahayana Buddhism and Tantricism. Mahayana Buddhism and Tantricism direct the Palinese towards the attainment of Dharma, moral duties which shape and sustain human life, artha, economic prosperity, kama, sensual pleasure, and moksha, spiritual liberation. The Buddha's Eightfold Path, a defining concept of Buddhism, serves as the main outline by which Huxley envisions his ideal society. To help man attain self-realization, Huxley recommends the Buddha's Eightfold Path. He writes in the Perennial Philosophy, as a means to salvation, these are the simultaneously ethical, intellectual, and spiritual, and have been summed up with admirable clarity and economy in the Buddha's Eightfold Path. Buddha's Noble Eightfold Path consists of proper view, intention, speech, action, livelihood, diligence, mindfulness, and concentration. Huxley was very much invested in divining the proper balance of human faculties, for example, intellect functioning in harmony with spirit and emotion, and imagining holistic cultural traditions and constructs in Pala to allow individuals' maximum potential to reach self-actualization or awareness. Through emphasizing balance in all things, Huxley mirrored the Gautama's vision of the middle path, positioning oneself between extremes. The citizens of Pala, in their daily lives, practice several aspects of the Eightfold Path and some of the Buddhist sutras. Buddhist mythology permeates the Palinese citizens' general culture. As Huxley describes in the novel, in the center of town is a small temple, with a central tower on which tier after tier a host of sculpted figures recounted the legends of the Buddha's progress from spoiled child to Tathagata. Thus, the Palinese are familiar with the Buddha's journey towards enlightenment. Birds on the island fly around singing attention and karuna, the Sanskrit word for compassion, reminding Huxley's characters to be constantly present and attentive to their surroundings. Palinese practice proper mindfulness in their work, spiritual, 
emotional, and love lives. As quoted in the novel, we make a point of being materialists concretely, materialistic on the wordless levels of seeing and touching, smelling, of tensed muscles and dirty hands. Abstract materialism is as bad as abstract idealism. It makes immediate spiritual experience almost impossible. Sampling different